Well, so today's a great honor to have uh, two uh, great researchers from Microsoft Research. And they're gonna give us a talk about sound capture and speech enhancement for communication and distance speech recognition. And uh, our speakers are Eva, uh, Tasha, and Sebastian Brown. Um, yeah, so uh, I was actually not, not sure, should I say Brown or Brown? Because uh, it was a famous <laughs> German scientist, right? Brown. <laughs> okay, so I, I just learned from uh, YouTube. <laughs> yeah, okay, so Brown is good? Okay, okay, great. So Eva, uh, so Eva been Microsoft since 1998, and he graduated PhD from uh, Technical University of Sofia, Bulgaria, and uh, become a assistant professor. Then he joined Microsoft in 1998. So obviously he has been there since 1998. So <laughs> it's very uh, quite uh, quite a long time. And I was an intern at Microsoft Research in 2004. 2005, 2006, and was a visiting 2007. So uh, I'm sure Ivan, I, I met Ivan at some point. I, I don't quite recognize you, but uh, but uh, but uh, yeah. So uh, I was there too. And uh, so Ivan is a very well-known researcher in uh, done excellent research in audio and acoustic research, and uh, he's leading the group right now in Microsoft Research at Redmond, and uh, published numerous papers and also. Mo uh, very importantly, also contributed a lot to the Microsoft, several of the Microsoft well-known products, such as Xbox and uh, Holloman. And uh, um, yeah, I keep the introduction short. So Sebastian Brown joined Microsoft about two, two years ago, three years ago. And uh, uh, so, um, uh, uh, so Brown, uh, graduate, Dr. Brown graduated a PhD uh, in uh, let me see if I can pronounce that in the, the International Audio Labert, uh, Laboratories, a joint institution for University of Annan, 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 Annan and Lumenberg and uh, Fraunhofer IS Germany. I hope that's correct. And <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so um, uh, uh, Sebastian also contributed a lot uh, to research, not only research, but also Microsoft products, uh, Windows, uh, Holloman as well. And uh, yeah, so today is a, a great honor to have both of them to give us the talk, the, the joint seminar. And uh, so let's welcome the speakers. And uh, thank you. So please uh, start your presentation by sharing the screen. Thank you. Good afternoon to those who are in the Seattle time zone. Good afternoon for those who are in Beijing. Good early morning to Sebastian, who is in Germany. And good whatever is for everybody in different time zones. <laughs> Seems that we are spanning across the globe. Thank you. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about sound capture and speech enhancement for communication and distance speech recognition. And we, me and Sebastian Brown, are both from Audio and Acoustics Research Group in Microsoft Research Labs in Redmond, Washington. I would like to start with some words about Microsoft Research, the organization we both belong to. Uh, then we'll discuss the scenarios and devices which need capturing of sound and what are those devices and the scenarios they're engaged. Then uh, we're going to talk about audio processing pipeline and st statistical speech enhancement. And then I will give the floor to Sebastian, who is going to continue with applications of deep learning methods of, for speech enhancement, and we'll end up with some conclusions. So, Microsoft Research. Uh, this organization was created 31 years ago with a memo from Nathan Merwell, then CTO of Microsoft Corporation, to Bill Gates stating that Microsoft should create its own research organization. And since then, the pillars of Microsoft research, the charter of the organization pretty much remains the same. Expand the state of the art in each of the areas in which we do research, which in general means publishing papers. That's the way to prove yeah, that we are pushing forward the state of the art. 
rapidly transfer innovative technologies to Microsoft products, which is the difference between us and academia because we do that extra mile of pushing those technologies to products. And the third is ensure that Microsoft products have a future. That's the long-term vision, detecting and encountering the trends in the industry and providing this feedback to Microsoft uh, leaders. Uh, after 1919, a lot of things changed. You can see that today Microsoft research spans across the globe. Besides the Microsoft research in Redmond, which is the oldest and the largest organi uh, organization, we do have Microsoft research in Cambridge, which is the second oldest, and Microsoft Asia in Beijing, which is the second largest organization, with filials in Microsoft research in Montreal, in New York, in England, in India, etc., etc. ATL stands for Advanced Technology Lab, and it's some kind of applied research labs, which we also have and support across the globe. So Microsoft Research has published more than twice as many artificial intelligence scholarly papers compared to our competitors. You can see on the left, in general, the this is average for, averaged for the years from 2000 to 2016, and papers which are published on the major artificial intelligence conferences. And on the right side, you can see uh, the numbers only in ICAST 2019 per organization. Uh, normal question here is to say, okay, where are the universities? There is no universities that university that has so large computer science faculty as all of those companies we're seeing here. Uh, so a lot of contributions of Microsoft researchers to Microsoft products. And for you, most probably this is a bunch of logos of Microsoft products. But for me, uh, this is kind of a, the story of my career and life since I joined Microsoft Research in 1998, I have participated in Microsoft Roundtable device. Okay, let me point that. So Roundtable device was my first project in Microsoft Research. I worked and contributed to Microsoft Connect. Uh, we did a lot of work in speech enhancement for Windows Embedded, etc., etc., etc. Uh, the audio and acoustics research group, you see it on the pictures. We do sound capture and speech enhancement, which is the topic of today's talk, but also plenty of work in spatial audio. We do a lot of work in audio analytics, which is emotion detection, uh, anything you can squish from speech beyond speech recognition. We have designed interesting audio devices. And since recently we do uh, audio or biosignal processing, especially in the area of brain computer interfaces. During the winter, you see our group on the picture, but during the summer you actually grow quite a bit. And this is the team in the summer of 2019, which is us plus our interns. And you can see that this is a quite diverse group of interns. Uh, I am proud that there is only two people born in the same country on this picture, and that country is Germany. Uh, so, Sebastian and one inter from Germany. Uh, so let's go back to the topic of our conversation this evening and talk about the scenarios and devices where we need capturing of sound and enhancing that sound. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of the devices in the world. I'm not even going to talk about the devices which are released by Microsoft Corporation. Uh, I'm going just to talk about the devices and scenarios where I took part in my career in Microsoft. Uh, so I mentioned already that Rincam was my first project in Microsoft Research. And uh, in general, the goal was to record meetings and to do meeting theorization. You can see here 
the recording device was called Rincam, and it provided 360 degrees video from the conference room. You can see here the 360 degrees video. And besides this, in the conference room, we had overview camera, also whiteboard camera, and portion of this 360 degrees image was extracted a so-called speaker view, which was done using face detection and sound source localization. And for many of us, this sounds like a relatively straightforward and easy thing to do, but think how it this sounded in 2001 when this project started to take shape. So the audio component, which I work it on, actually consisted with eight elements, circular microphone array here, bow down in the bottom. Uh, we did a sound source localization to assist the speaker view. Uh, of course, the microphones were combined with a beamforming and noise suppressor. And you can see the meeting diarization, here, which in this initial version was solely based on the sound source localizer. This was a very cool and interesting project. And later it became Microsoft product in 2007. It was released as a round table device. And Microsoft sold that business in 2009 to Polycom. And Polycom started to manufacture us CX5000 series. But this is the group of scenarios we face it when we do speech enhancement in capturing sounds in a conference room. Another interesting and quite challenging project was the in-car infotainment systems. So obviously in the car, your hands are on the wheel, your eyes are on the road, and the only communication channel left is speech. So this is the strive that the, of car makers to make a speech enabled system, command and control or spoken dialogue systems. And unfortunately in the car, we have a very challenging noise conditions. It's loud, it's a very variable noise. And still regardless of that in 2005, Fiat released so-called blue and me, a infotainment system, which was based on Microsoft Auto platform which was sitting on Windows embedded. And relatively soon, they sold around 1 million devices like this in the Fiat. Uh, they released EcoDrive application for download to that specific platform and combined it with TomTom for doing navigations a little bit later, I think in 2009. In 2007, Ford released Ford Sync which was also based on Windows embedded with Microsoft Auto and that specific audio speech enhancement pipeline, which is supposed to suppress enough of the noise in the car so the speech recognizer can do its job. And you all understand that in 2007, the speech recognizers were not that good as they are today. Those are still HMM based speech recognizers. So around 2 million in the market, Microsoft uh, helped Ford to release my Ford Touch in 2010. And in the same year, Hyundai and Kia Uvo, uh, uh, in Kia released so-called Uvo, which was the same in-car infotainment system with the same speech enhancement pipeline. Microsoft was just letting the car makers to do the tiny layer of code, which is the UI, which is specific for each car and for each brand. And of course, uh, gaming and entertainment also all are really wanting for getting command and control and speech enabled applications. Uh, in general, Microsoft uh, started to work for Kinect in Xbox in around 2008. Uh, the motivation was that expanding the customer base because still then most of the gamers were males in their 20s. And around 2006, Nintendo released Nintendo Wii, 
which was a game console, but also had some two controllers with uh, inertial uh, sensors in it. So you can shake them, you can dance, you can do some fitness, and suddenly the customer base started to be expanded towards the most, the more beautiful part of the human civilization, the women. Uh, Microsoft also liked this in 2008 released Xbox Lip, uh, Lips, which was karaoke game with two wireless microphones, again with inertial sensors, so you can sing, you can shake, you can dance, and that was enormous success. So the vision created for this was stand from the coach, no controller required, because many TVs actually became victims of a controller flying out of the hands of the, of the gamers. And because of that, talk and be understood. Because the only input and output modality left was human speech. So in general, uh, in 2010, Microsoft released Kinect for Xbox 2360, which device, you can see it, it contained a depth camera. Those are those two. One of them is the active illuminator. The other is the, the depth sensor itself. A web camera and a four element microphone array. Microphones are, microphones are hidden underneath the device. Uh, this was the first industrial product which contained surround sound echo cancellation. Considering the fact that the inventor of the echo cancellation himself wrote a paper in 1999 stating that stereoacoustic echo cancellation is theoretically impossible. Uh, also, uh, the first device allowing hands-free speech recognition from up to three and a half meters. And uh, the first product which is always on and always listening speech recognition. This good sound capturing can not only three and a half meters, you guys understand, the loudspeakers are blasting with quite loud levels. Gamers love that. Uh, this uh, speech enhancement pipeline allow it uh, good capture quality and good speech recognition. And of course, uh, this is actually an, an image of the, of the depth camera. You can see it. Literally, it's a black and white camera where the brighter parts means um, closer to the, to the person. What we can do with that, okay, we can quickly parse it, the human body on different pieces and then basically detect the positions X, Y, Z of the joints, which allow it gesture recognition, which was the second input modality in Kinect for Xbox 360. And based on this success in 2013 for the next generation of Xbox, Xbox One, Microsoft released Kinect for Xbox One. And this time we can see actually that the microphone array with the four microphones is detached as a separate block. The microphones are better, they are hypercardioids, and of course it provided a better speech recognition. In 20 12 and 2014, Microsoft released Kinect for Windows. So this is an SDK when you can connect this USB device to your computer and start to play and do cool research and interesting projects in the universities, which created a lot of excitement. And recently in 2019, Microsoft released Kinect for Azure. This time the depth camera and the web camera are smaller and instead of having a four element linear microphone array, we have a circular seven element microphone array on top of the device. Another scenario where we actually need and use speech enhancement and capturing of sounds is augmented in virtual reality. So roughly the difference between augmented and virtual reality is that in the virtual reality, the glasses are covering your uh, eyes and you can see what is inside, but you cannot see the real world. Pretty much all computer games are kind of virtual reality, except that in this particular case, you see that we have here the glasses covering, there is audio rendering, and again, 
will be nice, but not mandatory to have voice input. Uh, the cheap version of this are so-called smartphone holders. It's just a plastic thing and you insert your smartphone, which the screen is split on two. Uh, of, course, of course, the smartphone doesn't have a, the computing power of the PC. The virtual reality glasses are connected and the applications are very limited. So in 20, uh, 15 Microsoft released HoloLens, which was the first augmented reality device. So you can see the screens are transparent and you can see the external world. And then we can project image on the screens and eventually render the audio of that through the two loudspeakers, which are marketed in orange. But also the device does not have keyboard, does not have mouse, and one of the major modality for commanding this device is speech, which means that we should provide a relatively good speech enhancement. And the device has four microphones, basically targeting the mouth of the speaker. So we can actually clean up the signal from the environmental noise and provide it to the speech recognizer. And recently, actually, the uh, less than a year ago, Microsoft released HoloLens 2, which is improved version of HoloLens, no, uh, HoloLens 1, a little bit bigger display. The other thing is that the computer this time is in the back. So both devices are completely autonomous. They are not connected. They are not tethered to PC. Practically, you carry a one Windows 10 machine on the back, but this provides a better weight balance because the weight is distributed between the back and the fort where the screens are. So the common thing for all of those devices we just discussed is that they need to capture as human speech, need to clean it from the factors which we do not want and to make it enough good for the speech recognition and for telecommunication for scenarios like Skype, etc., etc. So let's see how an audio processing pipeline, which has quite common architecture in all of those devices, maybe because I have served as architect for most of them, uh, how this audio speech enhancement pipeline looks like. So here is the block diagram, and you can see that eventually we may start with one or more microphones, and then the first thing we should do is to remove the signal from the loudspeakers. They go from the loudspeakers to the microphone and the first serious block is acoustic echo cancellation. How to get rid of the sounds we know about. That's the signals we send to the loudspeaker. Normal next step, normal next step is to combine the microphones, the signals from the Microsoft, uh, from the microphones in a way to enhance the desired speech and to suppress the sounds coming from undesired direction. And we should mention here that both of those processing are linear. And typically when you architect such a pipeline, you move in this chain from the slower to the faster processing block. But after this came the nonlinear processing. And an example for this is the voice activity detector and the noise suppressor. But also I want to point out, see we have acoustic echo cancellation, which is linear, but we have acoustic echo suppression, which is nonlinear suppression based processor. Also we do have a beamforming, which is linear, but we also have the nonlinear counterpart, which is spatial filtering. And of course, we end up with quite standard acoustic gain, automatic gain control to provide relatively constant level of the voice, regardless of the distance the speaker is, or regardless of how loud each person, how loud voice has each person. So let's talk about the first block, so-called acoustic echo cancer. In general, we talk about these are acoustic echo reduction systems. We have to get rid of the signal. So here is 
the loudspeaker, the signal goes to the microphone with certain impulse response, we have the speech going there, we have noise. And now the idea of the acoustic echo cancer, which is adaptive filter, is to estimate the same impulse response to filter the signal from the loudspeakers and to subtract it. This cannot be perfect. And this is why we have certain residual here. And this residual is additionally suppressed by acoustic echo suppressor, which just works on energy base. It estimates how much energy from the loudspeaker signal is in this residual and try to suppress it in the same way as in the noise suppressor. So those two systems working together, this is part of every single speaker phone. That's one of the oldest signal processing algorithms and one of the traditional applications of the uh, LMS and NLMS adaptive filters. Now, what if you do, we do have stereo? Let's say we have left and the right channel, and then those two signals go to, to different func uh, transfer functions to the microphone. Can we just change to acoustic echo cancers? In short, the answer is no. Those two signals are highly correlated. And just using the logic, you, we have two unknowns and one equation. We have infinite number of solutions, also is known as non-uniqueness problem. And then the system can converge, but it may not be the true solution. And then what is going to happen is from the moment the content in the loudspeaker signal changes, we will have to reconverge again. In short, this doesn't work. So what else we can do? And here is the solution actually, which we do have in Kinect. Uh, what happens is that we play a chirp signals through the loudspeakers and estimate the transfer function between the left speaker and the microphone and the right speaker and the microphone. Then this ad adaptive filter, practically the its initial state is do nothing because we already have a solution. But if something happens here, changing of the, of the echo path, what is for, for sure, we do have always one solution. So the system follows it and stays converged. It is close to the optimal, but may not be exactly the optimal. So I can play for you those calibration chirps. Let me see. Uh, will this work? Nope. Uh, but in short, this is a musical signal. It is designed on purpose to cover all frequencies from all five channels, but it is not that unpleasant to listen to. Ah. Can you hear that? My computer sound? So this is pretty much the calibration signal. It's not some kind of irritating chirp, etc., etc. Something which is actually quite nice to listen to. And then we do sub echo cancellation and suppression on each of the four microphones. We have this thing repeated four times in Kinect or seven times in Kinect for uh, Azure. And then we go to the microphone array. So it's just several definitions. Microphone array is a set of closely positioned microphones. And beamforming is the process of making the microphone array to listen to give and look of direction and suppressing the sounds coming from other directions. Also, we can electronically change this direction, which is called beam steering. And also we can enforce listening to given direction, explicitly suppressing the sound coming from another direction, which is called null forming. And we can independently steer this null, which is called null steering. And in addition to that, using the four microphones, we can do sound source localization to tell where the sound came from. If nothing else, we have to point the beamformer to there. Otherwise, the beamformer is something quite simple. 
it is just a weighted sum of the signals from the microphones X multiplied by given complex weights, and this is the output signal. The key is estimation of those weights, so we can form a directivity pattern like this. So this is angle, and this is frequency. And you can see that this particular beam listens exactly at zero degrees, and this is the direction, the listening. And you can see that we do have some zeros, and we have some additional areas of increased sensitivity, which is called side lobes. So the time invariant, in the time invariant beamformer, we compute those weights in advance and keep them as they are. This rarely works quite well. And this is why pretty much the most common and standard thing is so-called adaptive beamformer. When on the fly, we estimate specifically the uh, weights so we can provide the best signal to noise ratio under the restriction that towards the listening direction we should have a unit gain and zero phase. And here is the directivity pattern of one specific instance. So the microphone ray listens around 20-ish degrees. You can see here the highest sensitivity but also we have a signal competing speaker which we want to suppress at around minus eight degrees and you can see how the adaptive beamformer plays at a nice and cool null trying to suppress this interfering sound source in the best way again here this is the angle and this is frequency literally this is the picture here but looked from above so now, if we know where the sound source is, or even better, if we know when the inter where the interfering sound source is, we can actively place nulls and poles and do the best suppression. Uh, to guess where the sound source is, we have to somehow find how, uh, where the sound source is. And this all starts with so-called spatial probability estimation. And I'm showing you here two examples, two different approaches. And you can see the papers right here, which are they, they are based on. The first is so-called instantaneous direction of arrival. Let's say for the four element microphone array, we take the phase differences between channel one and two, one and three, one and four. And if you place them, you see they found a group around a line. This line is what the phase difference is supposed to be, let's say, for sound source of minus 90 degrees, zero degrees, plus 90 degrees. And then it's relatively easy to select only the frequency uh, instances, which are, let's say, if you want to listen at 45 degrees, to let only those to be here or to estimate, in general, the probability of sound source presence as a function of the basically the angle. Another approach is using relative transfer functions, which can be estimated again as literally uh, using this formula and using channel one as a reference signal. And then if we want to listen to a given direction, let's say 45 degrees, the cosine of the angle between those two vectors is in general proportional to the probability. Knowing the probability density functions, we can relatively easily estimate the probability that this sound source is at any given angle. And let's see how this thing works. This is a demonstration of the Microphone Array audio capture technology developed at Microsoft Research. Audio is captured at 16 kilohertz sampling rate. A USB device captures all microphone signals, which are processed in real time by the host computer. We were going to see something like this. So see here in this particular setting, we have between minus 90 and plus 90 degrees, an interfering sound source at 50 degrees and a speaker in the center and that, spe that human speaks 
part of the time. Uh, using this probability density function, it is pretty much a straightforward to find for the current frame the maximum, one or maybe more. And then after some very simple clustering, we can go and track one or more sound sources. Of course, if you want to track those sound sources as they move, we we'll have to apply something a little bit more complex like Kalman filtering, etc., etc. And also, given this probability for each of the frequency beam in each frame, we can estimate relatively easy a suppression gain and apply it. And this is so-called spatial filter, the nonlinear part of the spatial selection, the counterpart of the beam former. And you can see here how the directivity of a given microphone array increases with applying this special filter. So the blue dashed line is just the beamformer and the green line is the beamformer and the special filter. This is a demonstration of the microphone array audio capture technology developed at Microsoft Research. Audio is captured at 16 kilohertz sampling rate. A USB device captures all microphone signals, which are processed in real time by the host computer. Let's go and talk a little bit about the last block in this statistical based noise, uh, statistical based speech enhancement pipeline. And this is the stationary noise suppressor. Uh, all of the processing in the entire pipeline happens in frequency domain. So we do convert the signals in frequency domain at the very beginning, the microphone signals, and you will do this inverse FFT at the very end after the automatic gain control. But in general, the anatomy of a noise suppressor consists of a voice activity detector, which controls the updating of the noise model. We need the variances of the noise when no one is speaking. And then there is a computation of so-called suppression rule which is applied to magnitudes separately and combined combine with the phases. This is pretty much what the noise suppressor does. It's a gain-based processing. So the goal is to estimate this gain, to multiply the input signal, and you can get the estimation of the clean speech. So this gain is a time varying non-negative real value gain. It's just a, typically a number between zero and one. The higher, the, be, the higher is the probability or estimation that we do have speech there. The lower, this means close it close to zero. How we can do this? And this is also one of the oldest algorithms, but let's start with the voice activity detector. From probability density functions of the noise and the speech, we can compute the likelihood ratio. And this is the paper which actually is one of the fundamental papers in the voice activity detector. Uh, then this likelihood ratio can be smoothed and then converted to a probability. And based on this probability, we update the noise model. So components are the noise model from the previous frame. We use this probability as a weighting function. And also there is a time constant, tau p, which tells us how quickly, how fast we're going to, to move. This is pretty much the purpose of the voice activity detector to update the noise model. Now, the suppression rule. We already estimated the prior and posterior signal to noise ratios. One of the first suppression rule is defined by Norbert Winner, which is just divided the variances of the clean speech of the clean speech plus, plus noise. And you can see it here as a blue line. And this is a signal estimator in terms of minimum square, uh, mean square error. A little bit later that was modified for better, best estimation of the magnitude, 75 and also for best maximum likelihood estimation in 85. Those are quite straightforward single dimensional rules that things got way more complicated in 1984 
when Ephraim and Mala defined the separation rule as function of both prior and posterior SNR, and you can see here the function of this rule as function of the prior and posterior SNR. And this is optimal in mean square error. A year later, the same two guys published a solution in the log mean square error and a bunch of efficient alternatives, but I just wanted to say that this is the difference between mean square error and log mean square error estimation. Uh, this is just one dB difference, so not that much of a difference. And actually one interesting, at least, I think it is in 2014 paper, where we actually tried to learn this suppression rule from the data. Uh, but now, if we return back, I will return a slide back. Here we found that we have to know the prior signal to noise ratio, the clean signal divided by this, the noise. And this is not something we know because we try to estimate it. So uh, how to estimate this prior signal to noise ratio? Uh, we can do this quite uh, maximum likelihood approximation or use so-called decision directed approach, again defined by Ephraim and Malach, which in general they say that it is so signals in the frames are highly correlated and we can use the output of our previous noise suppression from the previous frame. Anyway, uh, we end up with this suppression rule, which is actually derived under the assumption that we have a mixture between speech and noise. What about cases when we have just noise? Apparently this whole map is not going to work and this is why Ephraim and Malach and Michael and Malpass actually offer modified sup uh, suppression rule, which is just multiplied by the probability that we do have speech signal in the frame. So you see that we do have here a bunch of estimations, time constants, adaptation time constants, etc., etc., etc. And on top of that, Actually, we don't need mean square error estimation. We really want humans to perceive it as good quality. So then what we can do is to go and try to look at this problem of the statistical noise suppressor as optimization problem. And in Connect Pipeline, we had 75 parameters of various nature. And we define this optimization criterion which is mostly PESC with some help from acoustic echo suppression, signal to noise ratio, log spectral distance, mean square error. And then you literally formally on a computing cluster in 2010, try to tune and to tweak those uh, parameters on a data corpus, which covers the scenarios we want to do. And this is how it looks like. So this is the loudspeaker level. And this is the improvements in the word error rate. You see at maximum loudspeaker level, we had a hundred, we assume that this is the hundred percent. Obviously decreasing of the loudspeaker level, the word error rate goes down, but still it is above uh, the, our release criteria. Then we applied the speech enhancement audio pipeline and hey, it does a quite good job up to certain level of noise. And then after running this on a cluster, we have it again, the word error rate, but still we have here an area where we don't meet the release criteria. So at that particular case, we have to retrain the acoustical model of the speech recognizer so we can release the product. Overall, the statistical speech enhancement works under the following assumptions. Noise has Gaussian distribution. The speech signal has Gaussian distribution, so the math can go quite nice. Noise changes slower than the speech signal, and we really need a minimum mean square error or, or whatever, maximum likelihood estimator. 
and also to be able to process them independently, we assume that the signals in different frequency beams are statistically independent, and so the signals in the consecutive are audio frames. And based on this, the entire math for the statistical signal processing is built. For all of those, only the first is correct. Everything else is not true. It's approximation to make our life easier. Yes, this thing worked quite well in Roundtable, in Skype, in Microsoft Auto, in Connect, but this is something which should be addressed. So in conclusion, most of the modern devices include speech input for communication and speech recognition. But they operate in more and more challenging environments, reverberation, echo, noise. And speech recognition and voice commands make the things worse because when you do communication, you have to hear the other party. And there is a certain amount of power we can punch in your ears before to rupture your drums. So you won't take a call, let's say when it is 80 or 90 dB noise. We'll go to some quiet place. But if the speech recognizer works, I don't mind asking questions, even on a stadium when the noise is 120 dB. Uh, from this point, using multiple microphones provides opportunity for better reduction of this unwanted noise. And we can say that the statistical signal processing is computationally and memory inexpensive but already pretty much saturated in terms of improvements. All of the algorithms for the classic statistical noise suppression and much more, you can find in this book. Uh, and there are details. Of course, you can go to our page and look at the papers, but I think now it's time to talk about more serious methods of using deep learning for speech enhancement, with which, Sebastian, you have the floor. Great. Um, so um, my talk will be a bit, uh, I picked here two topics of um, applying kind of deep learning methods and speech enhancement in my talk. Um, so the first one will be about um, single channel um, deep noise separation. And the second bit shorter part will be about uh, voice activity detection also using, uh, using deep learning. Um, so um, here in, in the, when, when we use, um, first it will be about uh, deep learning based uh, real-time noise suppression. Um, so basically the, the application here is any kind of uh, real-time communication application like we have now and um, using laptops, mobile phones, uh, whatever we have. Um, and of course the, the aim is um, to reduce any background noise and to keep, to keep the speech, to improve the intelligibility, improve audio and speech quality, um, reduce listener fatigue and so on, and kind of, for example, meeting scenarios or phone calls. Um, so this is a quite a recent um, development in research. So it started maybe six years ago where the first uh, neural networks were adopted for speech enhancement. And since about two years, um, we see now actually already popping up some of those uh, networks in commercial applications. And um, it's a quite um, exciting um, and groundbreaking novelty compared to a classic statistical based um, noise suppression, uh, which mainly only was able to tackle quasi stationary noise while um, deep learning based methods kind of uh, can learn more or less any type of uh, noise, uh, specifically any, any heavy transient uh, and tonal noise, for example. Um, so there are quite a few challenges that have to be solved uh, when you try to solve this with deep learning. So um, first of all, you, of course, you need uh, to have a very low delay requirement if you target real-time uh, communication. Um, usually those um, applications run on, on uh, edge devices, which are resource constraints. So uh, the inference complexity is, is a big, big issue on, on deploy, deploying those uh, networks. Um, in, in general, 
Um, if you use uh, machine learning, um, you have to optimize uh, on some criterion. And this is a big problem we have in uh, speech enhancement. If you target a human listener, uh, so you, you want to um, improve food, human perception, intelligibility, or listening comfort, which is actually extremely difficult and, and complex to measure uh, in, in practice. So that's, that's kind of a big, big issue where we're dealing with. Um, then, of course, the question is how do you evaluate those methods? Do you do a subjective or computational metrics? Um, a big, big challenge is to create kind of a large enough and realistic data set that um, covers all uh, the acoustic effects, the audio quality, and basically is, achieves uh, sufficient generalization so that it actually really works and with real world signals. And um, kind of one a very new problem that hasn't been kind of there with for traditional signal processing methods is that you actually have to really carefully um, classify and define what sounds um, you you uh, want to keep and what so what sounds are desired and undesired in your scenarios. Uh, so think about um, okay, you want to have spoken speech. What well, what about laughing? What about coughing? What about sneezing? Uh, any kind of non-vocal sounds that are from a human. Um, it's, it's kind of a very hard definition problem what in the end you want to keep and what not, which makes the problem um, quite complex. Um, so I um, structured this part in a kind of a modular way. So at first talk about some, how you can modularize a deep learning system for speech enhancement. Uh, in particular, this will be data generation and evaluation, then the loss function and training. Um, then I'll talk about some computationally efficient uh, network architectures, then some results and conclusions. Um, so in uh, particular, um, in this uh, talk, I'm using here only constraining myself to um, networks that operate in the frequency domain. So um, you have, uh, can also, use this pointer. Um, you have um, a, a short-term Fourier transform and uh, inverse short-term Fourier transform and some processing in between. Um, so then you extract some features uh, in the frequency domain, uh, run and th through a DNN that predicts some target, which can be some kind of filter or just the uh, signal itself. And then you do some enhancement, maybe, maybe apply the filter and you get after AS50 your estimated speech signal. This whole thing is trained on the loss and of course a very important part is the data set. So all these are kind of independent blocks that you can basically target in the individually and try to uh, make a research project out of it, try to improve it. And I've, I've just wrote here a couple of examples of choices that have been made in, in literature and um, you can already see that, that quite, there's quite a large complexity of combinations that you can, can, can come up with. Um, so I'm basically trying to target most of, of those blocks individually now. Um, and um, I'll first talk about um, evaluation methods. Um, so there are kind of uh, four uh, possibilities that uh, we used here. Um, so the first uh, thing is if you have a synthetic um, training or validation data set, uh, you have access to uh, noisy and clean speech. So you can compute uh, intrusive metrics like pass, capture distance, field spectral distance, signal to distortion, distortion ratio, and so on, um, which um, give you a good indication, but um, they actually um, don't measure 100% what you're actually interested in, which is in the, in the normal case, the subjective um, human perceived quality measured by MOS, I mean opinion score. Um, so we have kind of uh, conducted now already three um, uh, deep noise suppression challenges, which you see here, uh, which target this problem. Um, and uh, they all evaluated uh, using uh, crowdsourced MOS ratings. Um, and also in the la latest challenge, we now used uh, IDUP.835 ratings, which give you a bit more um, detailed insights by measuring speech quality, background noise, and overall quality. 
And, but of course, this is expensive. Um, it takes so long a time and you, you cannot run this in real time to get measurements from uh, human subjects. Um, so another possibility is if you have such a data set with MOS ratings, you can train a neural network to predict those uh, mean opinion score, which is called uh, DNS MOS. So this will be also published at uh, ICASP this year. And um, what uh, um, very few people do until now is uh, a, a very uh, important thing. So uh, if you target real time, um, speech enhancement, not only the audio quality is important, but also the computational cost. And so we measure this here in uh, multiple accumulate operations. And one big um, thing that, that I see in, in a lot of papers that people state uh, their complexity in terms of trainable parameters of, of their networks, but this is actually not an indicator at all for complexity. So this is why, um, so it can be quite different. So uh, the, the number of max is a much uh, better indicator of the complexity. Um, so I just wanna to touch very briefly here on the data generation and augmentation um, side. Um, so in, in principle, what you just do is you have a data set of uh, clean speech and noise and you add, um, you use those to synthesize a training mixture, a noisy training mixture, and you also create a corresponding training target, which is only the speech. And um, it's important to, to mix those uh, signals with a kind of a expected distribution, which is, for example, the SNR distribution, also create a varying, varying signal levels, which we also here model by a simple Gaussian distribution. And what's a very crucial step is here that you also take um, acoustic effects into account like reverberation. So we add um, room pass responses, um, convolve room pass responses with all the speech um, samples. And we also have measurements if the speech itself is already reverberant. So then we don't apply a room pass response um, to make it um, more realistic. And also an important uh, step we do here is uh, kind of to shape the reverberation uh, when creating the target signal, uh, which essentially uh, reduces reverberation in the target signal. And then you, uh, your uh, network also learns to, to do uh, de-reverberation. Um, and all the data that we used here to train those networks are also publicly available um, it's as part of the deep noise suppression challenges. Um, so just to touch uh, briefly on um, loss functions, how you, what, what you optimize your networks on. So those are all, we did a pretty big survey on spectral distance based loss functions. Uh, so we tried here all different kind of um, uh, distance metrics that you can come up with like L1, L2 norm, log spectral amplitude, some uh, com applying some compression to the mean square to the uh, signals, signal ratios, ratios correlation and some speech distortion weighted loss. And you can apply all these uh, metrics to either the spectral magnitudes only or to the complex signal. And one interesting effect that we found is um, if you weight uh, the magnitude only and the complex loss, which is uh, done by this uh, Weight, weighting factor here on, on this graph. You can see a very interesting effect that kind of, for all the, the distance metrics, uh, a weighting between magnitude and complex kind of gives you a better performance than uh, either magnitude or complex only. Um, so the best loss we found uh, among those is this applying some compression, um, which also is uh, not that surprising because it kind of mimics the, the human ear perception with this uh, compression factor. Um, just to touch very briefly on um, training and, and data augmentation. Um, so we, we tried, um, looked at in different um, augmentation effects, like what happens if you just mix your signals as they are. Um, so this was already for an existing small scale data set. If you further augment uh, it to, to more varying uh, SNR levels, you can see you can train uh, much longer and basically in the end give, you know, obtain a better uh, PESC on your um, data set, on your test set. 
If you do additional spectral augmentation, you get even better. Um, then one interesting effect that we saw is if you do all these three augmentations, um, the, um, the purple curve actually doesn't improve over the yellow curve. So it's actually a small degradation. And this is one thing we propose here to do um, utterance level um, normalization before computing the loss. So you can imagine when your signals have a lot of varying signal levels, one signal might be very high, one signal might be very low, and you all have those in the same batch that you optimize on. Uh, this might create an imbalance. So we normalize all those signals before computing the loss. And you can see the, the um, green curve basically overcomes this problem. And in the end, you end up with a, a robust optimization uh, procedure, which is robust also against um, varying signal levels. Um, and this is just a, a simple heuristic stop criterion we used here on uh, to stop the training, uh, which is based on, on intrusive uh, classic uh, metrics. A question uh, here? Yes. A quick question. Uh, just curious, uh, I, I'm not working on speech, but I'm just curious. So here, uh, it, look, it does not look like end to end to me, right? I, I know it's, it's uh, uh, I'm just curious, uh, do people try to remove the feature step? Um, yes, some people do. Okay, um, so what's, what's your experience with that? Um, so I, I haven't done a, a formal um, um, comparison on, on the uh, learning features versus uh, using handcrafted features. Uh, but there are a few publications and, and very recent ones um, that actually show the, in, in practice, if you uh, test them on, on real world signals, um, it's actually that, um, so on, on synthetic data sets, then you might observe a benefit from learned feature extraction. But um, often if you test them on real world signals, which have a lot of diff different acoustic conditions, reverberation and so on, um, then this does not generalize, and then uh, um, it might actually work worse than kind of more general handcrafted features. Um, so there's there's uh, still uh, more more work to be done on also on the Thank feature expansion, or how much that actually benefits in in the real world. Um, Excuse yeah. me, so, I also have a question here. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I have a question about the uh, in the inverse STFT here. So uh, when you try to use the inverse STFT here, are you also using the face information or just using magnitude? Yes, yes, of course. Um, otherwise your, you, your signal would sound horrible. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah so of course. But it's, the, the networks we, we uh, use in, in this work only um, operate on, on uh, log uh, magnitude. Uh, spectral features and also only uh, predict uh, real valued suppression filters, so they don't enhance the phase. Uh, but you can also uh, come up with a network that does that. We would just restrict it ourselves to that in this world. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Then um, the next thing is um, to, to look into network architectures. So um, the motivation is um, there ex exist many different architectures, but uh, first of all, what they have to fulfill is a real time uh, requirement, which is um, ideally having no delay and also being uh, small enough and efficient enough that you can run them on, on any kind of consumer device. Um, and um, as a baseline, we use here a very simple um, so just recurrent uh, network, which operates just on a single frame in frame out basis, but uh, through those uh, recurrent layers here, it also has a temporal memory. And a um, more sophisticated network architecture is here a kind of a convolutional recurrent unit. Um, that's basically an improvement of um, some architecture uh, proposed in 2018. And as a bunch of convolutional encoder and decoder layers and uh, kind of a unit shape and in the middle it has a recurrent layer. 
Uh, also, we, we um, improved it a bit, little bit here with adding these uh, convolutions in the skip connections. And it uses um, 2D uh, convolutional kernels where the temporal dimension is just two. So you can see um, how it aggregates information over time uh, by simply always just aggregating in each layer just two neighboring frames. And with that, it, uh, uh, it's a causal convolution, so it does not look uh, into the future. Um, and also by, by having this only uh, a current, very small kernel size of two, it's actually very efficient. Uh, because the larger you make this kernel, this, this filter size, of course, the, the more computations you have to do. Um, one um, improvement we did here uh, was to look at the um, increasing the memory capacity. So I'll do this maybe a bit faster. So the, the essential idea is here that, that we observed um, that the wider you make uh, a recurrent layer, uh, the better your network performs. So you see we have, if you look at this NSNet, this uh, recurrent only um, network structure, if you make the network wider, so the, the numbers are all different networks uh, growing in, in the width, we plot this here on the computational complexity in terms of max on the x-axis and the um, improvements of mean opinion score on the y-axis. And you see it's kind of uh, uh, increasing behavior, but it also saturates at some point. Um, and now if you compare this to um, the Cruz uh, model, this uh, convolutional recurrent structure, which is the uh, red line, you see a similar behavior, it overall performs better uh, and also saturates. Um, to make this a bit more efficient, because I would say anything above uh, 4 million, so this, those are million max per frame, so to infer one frame is kind of already uh, on, on the complex side to, to run on, on any uh, consumer device. Um, uh, what we did here is split these, uh, this fully connected recurrent layer into multiple disconnected smaller recurrent layers. And then you can see if you do this, if you have one fully connected, split it into two or four or eight uh, disconnected channels, you can basically reduce the, the complexity while still uh, losing only very little MOS improvement performance. So you see and at some point it has a very steep drop off. So that's kind of a very nice um, efficiency optimization. So in the ideal case, you want to end up here in the um, upper left corner to have the lowest complexity with the best MOS improvement. Um, if we now um, look at uh, many different network architectures to put all this complexity into perspective, so again, we have here a number of million max per frame over MOS improvement. And to put the whole thing into a bit into perspective, what's very interesting, this black diamond here is a classic noise suppressor. So it actually does not do too bad. It's, uh, of course, the most improvement is very limited, just above 0 0.1, but it's, of course, extremely efficient. It's maybe even below 10,000 max. So those are all million max. So for, given that, it actually does a pretty decent job. Um, and now if we, uh, and you can also do pretty inefficient, as an example, we took here uh, this uh, gray triangle. This is something with 280 million uh, max. So this is, it does a pretty good job in most improvement, but it's extremely inefficient. Um, so interesting observations here is if you look at the, uh, oh, sorry, oh, there's no image, oh. Yeah, if you look at uh, the recurrent only networks, they're all kind of, you find them on a almost linear line. So the larger you make your network, um, the better most improvement you get. Um, and this is a kind of a similar trend that you see for all, if you plot more, more networks on, in this graph. And now let's just look at the improvements that we made. So um, the original architecture of this convolutional recurrent uh, network by that LSTM had actually two LSTM layers in the middle. It's so replaced it with this with uh, GRU. So then you uh, save a huge amount of complexity with almost no uh, performance loss. If you go from uh, 
two uh, recurrent layers only to one recurrent layer, you make a, again a huge computational saving by basically losing, losing nothing. Um, we explored here what happens if you go from a 2D to a 1D convolutions, which means you don't extract any temporal information. So we see this is actually a serious uh, performance degradation. So that means to extracting some temporal information with the uh, convolutional layers is actually very helpful. Um, uh, question, question here. Uh, yeah, it probably shows that I'm not uh, doing research in this area, but I'll ask anyway. So why, why does numbers you show the speed or on the CPUs, not, not GPUs? Just curious. Um, because the, this is uh, how, how um, on, on many devices you don't even have a, a, a GPU, right? Um, so um, and, and to, to be able to run on, on any general device, uh, lo look at mobile phones, look at uh, cheap uh, uh, customer, consumer laptops, um, then you may, might not have a, a GPU. Um, so all the, we're, we're targeting all kinds of devices. Now we, we have popping up more and more uh, wearable devices, like uh, think about smart earbuds or think about um, uh, smart glasses, virtual reality glasses, right? They're all heavily uh, resource constrained. So you really have to take uh, the, the inference complexity into account. You, you don't have the, the computational power that, that you uh, have in, in the cloud for doing speech recognition. Mm -hmm. So the main trend, or or is still using CPUs. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if this is the trend, but um, I, I think you should be very mindful with the computational complexity you have mm -hmm. to achieve some task. I mean, compare this to the classic noise suppressor that you have here. That's what what what's usually used and for to to achieve some speech enhancement. Now look at what what complexity you have to spend uh, with. Uh, some neural networks to achieve kind of one, like uh, one or two times the, the MOS improvement, which is not that much going from 0 0.1 to and 0. Again, to this is the example about the inference, mm -hmm. the execution of the model. The training, of course, happens on GPUs, etc., etc. Yeah. But the inference is what matters. This is what the consumer gets to do. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then um, the next step, uh, the improvement was the, uh, applying this uh, grouping of the, the RNNs, which uh, shows some degradation, but also you do a, a pretty significant complexity saving. And uh, then the um, uh, convolutional skip connections that we proposed give another small MOS improvement that basically um, no um, complexity change, which is nice. Um, yeah, so that's kind of gives you an overview how, how much you can gain by, by making some changes to the network architecture and, and to basically lose not much performance. Um, to put this in, in a more recent perspective, so those are the uh, results on the, the actual um, uh, subjective crowdsourced most results from the uh, second deep noise suppression challenge. Um, and the uh, cruise, uh, the cruise model here um, performed uh, pretty well. Um, as you see here, that is the last uh, colored column here is, is the overall most. The other, other column most, uh, columns are just subsets of the data set. And this did pretty well uh, among all the other submissions while being actually a very small and efficient network. Um, so the, the, there's not, not much clarity on, on how large and efficient the other networks are actually. So we try to enforce that in, in future challenges that you also have to state the, your actual uh, complexity a bit um, more better. Um, then I'll play a quick demo if that works. Hi, so this is a quick test uh, recording um, where I'm trying to talk uh, while simultaneously playing some guitar. So uh, let's see how the noise suppression deals with my amazing guitar skills here. And we can also 
play some drums on the guitar or uh, take this spoon like up here and make some other noise um, or I have uh, my on my phone some background noise which I can play back so this is kind of a cafeteria babbling scenario which is played from these uh, small loudspeakers with a subwoofer in the room so yeah, that's kind of annoying so let's uh, switch on the noise suppression hi so this is a quick test of a recording um, where I'm trying to talk uh, while simultaneously playing some guitar. So uh, let's see how the noise suppressor deals with my amazing guitar skits here. And we can also play some drums on the guitar or um, take this spoon like up here and make some other noise. Um, or I have uh, my on my phone some background noise which I can play back. So this is kind of a cafeteria babbling scenario which is played from these uh, small loudspeakers with a subwoofer in the room. So yeah, that's kind of annoying. So let's uh, switch on the noise suppression. Get the I have some more sound examples. Um, I can play them later to save some time. Um, so um, to draw some conclusions, um, we've seen that um, nowadays with recent advancements, um, DNN-based speech enhancement without look ahead in real time is, is well possible with uh, smaller than uh, computational effort than um, maybe two years ago. Um, what's very important in, in deep learning based methods is the data, which uh, for speech enhancement, it kind of defines the signal model itself and is kind of crucial for the success. Um, and the loss function itself is, is uh, extremely uh, valuable um, optimization um, or, or component um, because it improves your model at zero inference cost. Um, so we, we used here a signal-based um, loss, including magnitude and phase and compression to, to mimic human perception and also level normalization. Um, interesting ob observation is that uh, the model size scales the, the quality and um, we found kind of a, a direct influence of the model with, with, uh, with and the memory capacity with the enhancement performance. Um, for this uh, cruise uh, model architectures, we kind of proposed um, a, a significant uh, efficiency improvements, speeding up the efficiency over five times over existing uh, similar architectures. Um, and kind of um, general observation is that recurrent networks seem to be more efficient for very small models, but if you um, want to achieve a better um, performance than having combined convolutional encoders and decoders with recurrent layers that gives you a, a better quality. Um, so um, now I want to still briefly touch on um, the second project, which is um, voice activity detection. Um, so applications for uh, voice activity detection are very diverse. So you can use it for audio file labeling, basically labeling is there speech present or not to segment an audio stream into containing speech or non-speech. Um, it's, it's used in many, many speech uh, processing blocks uh, where you need uh, information of if their speech active or not. You can use it to estimate the signal to noise ratio or speech activity ratio and so forth and so on. So there are really many applications and it's almost in any speech enhancement or speech processing application and there's a VAD built in. Um, design choices for it are very important, uh, the temporal granularity, which kind of um, immediately defines the delay when you get a decision for when, if speech is active or not. And kind of a tuning uh, application dependent uh, parameter is how do you tune it? Do you tune it for best speech, de speech detection or the best overall detection error? Um, so the, the work I did here was looking into training targets for improving the noise robustness for voice activity detection. So what traditionally is done is, um, let me switch to my pointer again. Um, 
you define your VAD based on the energy level only from the clean speech when you train. So when you train and want to make your VAD robust against noise, you train on clean speech and mix it with uh, background noise. But the VAD decision is only made on the clean speech. Um, what we explored here is um, to, to use a different training target, which is the so-called voice-to-noise ratio. So it's basically a signal-to-noise ratio, which you could just call it voice-to-noise ratio. Also weighted with a male weighting uh, to make it more perceptually similar to the human perception. So it basically tells you uh, something about the information, um, if the speech active and what's the, the ratio to the background noise. And we also looked uh, if you can use both of those for multi-target training. So yeah, kind of the, the motivation is uh, the voice to noise ratio gives you an additional information over the uh, uh, VAD itself, which is a kind of a binary classification, whereas this is a continuous training target. And the VAD is also ill-defined at very low SNR. So imagine you have uh, speech active, but you have um, extremely loud noise, which actually covers the speech. So you don't even hear the speech, but then your VAD says, okay, there's speech active. The, the question is how useful is this? So if you just want to assess this particular audio example, then this uh, voice to noise ratio might give you more detailed information because it says uh, there might be speech present, but at a very low uh, level or at a very with a very high background noise level. So this might be presumably more robust at low as in ours. Um, yeah, and, and it's more, also if you use a threshold on this, it gives you a more meaningful um, value instead of just having a classification um, target. Um, I don't want to go into much detail on the network model we used here. It's, it's again, a very simple uh, real-time capable network um, using no look ahead, um, also very efficient. So it, it takes just seven milliseconds to infer one frame of audio on a CPU, on a standard CPU. Um, so I can mention videos also very as a side task among running among many, many other tasks. So you cannot spend a, a lot of computational complexity on this if you have some real time application running. Um, the uh, evaluation, evaluation here is um, shown on the uh, area under the curve. So the higher of this percentage, the better and uh, evaluated on real recorded data sets, which is kind of essential if you evaluate any deep learning methods, uh, because just using a synthetic data set might not give you a, a very realistic um, evaluation. As a baseline, we have here a model, a pretty good VAD model. Uh, however, it is very complex. So you can see the inference time they stated was 200 milliseconds per second of you running on a GPU. So compared to hours, just taking seven milliseconds on a CPU and being online processing. And this was the baseline is also offline processing because it uses temporal attention. So it needs some future information. Um, and now those uh, four um, lines are uh, our network with uh, different training targets. So you see if you just use the VAD as a training target, um, it actually does uh, worse, than, not bad, but worse than the others. If you just train on the voice to noise ratio, that works better than um, the VAD. And if you do multi-target training, you train on both, um, then you have to decide, okay, which output do you use? So the network provides you a VAD and a VNR output. And those are the two bottom lines. If you ever use the, the VAD output or the VNR output, um, those are the, the results that you get. And you see, again, using the VNR output gives you kind of the best performance. And it performs on this data set uh, similar as, as the baseline. And on this data set, which is actually much more difficult and diverse, that's also why the overall results are a bit lower. Um, so these are a lot of real, it's 70 hours of real recordings of real life scenarios like children playing and in the living room and the garden and so on. So very difficult um, and it achieves uh, the best um, performance on this. 
and um, to get a bit more insight in the robustness against a noise. So this, these are the ALK, uh, is the ALK performance over the SNR conditions. And you see uh, in the blue line is only uh, the, the VAD network, which does uh, performs the, all the same for high SNR, but at low SNR, the VAD only prediction network performs worse than the networks which also predict uh, the VNR. So that's uh, kind of proves that, uh, that the VNR is, is a more robust and useful training target in, in noisy conditions. Um, so to conclude, um, both kind of the, the overall talk, um, we've seen that uh, deep learning based speech and audio processing is becoming more and more feasible and practically attractive. Um, and the usefulness of uh, the contribution of, of neural networks re replacing traditional signal processing blocks always should be evaluated really carefully on real data, um, on well-chosen metrics, um, and also weighted against the computational burden. So it is it's pretty uh, um, obvious if you spend more computational effort, you get a better results. But you always have to put into perspective what you actually spend to achieve a goal. Um, and we've shown that uh, there's still large, large optimization potential for DNN-based speech enhancement and uh, voice activity detection. Um, of course, you can even make even further improvements on those, uh, this performance with this complexity trade-offs, uh, which are actually also uh, uh, required when you target even more low power devices, mobile applications. Um, and yeah, we've, we've seen um, that um, carefully chosen training targets also for both speech enhancement and voice activity detection can provide a, a large uh, performance and robustness uh, boost. So with that, I think we're already a bit over time. I'll conclude my part and maybe there's more need for discussions and questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I'm continue being curious so one thing is that does it doesn't even make sense to think about those things in the to do this to those things on the cloud um i'm i think rather not um because uh, the the delay is is a, a big issue in real time uh, yeah. communication right um so that uh that there might just be a, a too large delay if you first have to send your audio to a server uh, process it there and then send it further. So the delay is really crucial to have a, a good communication. So this is why the, the, the most straightforward way is to do inference on the device itself. But again, this the inference and the training itself happens in the cloud during the design mm -hmm. of the new. Yeah, the... yeah. Thank you. Um, Another thing I'm curious is uh, what about uh, like those multi-modal kind of research for, for example, combining speech and uh, computer vision. That's uh, that's a useful thing to do. Or you, I mean, any useful scenario you can think about, any important scenario you can think about to make that kind of research useful. Like speech and uh, speech enhancement, for example, with uh, with uh, with computer vision. Yes, yes, of course. The, there are many attempts already uh, out there. Yes, if, would, for for example, for even detecting if, if you're speaking or for voice activity detection and for, for speech announcement, there's certainly information that you can use, yes. Great. But it's, the, the, the question is, is of course, um, how much you benefit from it. Um, so you, you have to also have to process your image signal in addition to the audio signal. So again, then you have to wait, okay, is it really worth spending uh, this additional computational cost? But uh, there, there should is definitely some improvement to get if you're just looking for the enhancement performance, yes. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, I, will, I will ask uh, maybe others who have some questions. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about the, the demo of the last part of uh, the first part of the talk. I noticed that the later part of the demo uh, does not work as well as the former part of the demo about the, the speech enhancement. Is that because the background noise is very similar to the female speech? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the, the beginning of your question. Uh, may yeah, I ask I will... 
there was uh, some bandwidth problems because I also couldn't hear well Sebastian's Kenyan voice and I have heard the demo live and it doesn't sound like this. Oh, there was okay. some background uh, bandwidth issues for, during the transmission. Okay, so we will we, we send the slides then you can play back the, the video on your computer. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, can I have the question here? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, I'm from the re I'm a researcher from JD on the, the uh, leadership of Xiaodong, and uh, we have the question about the loss functions of the speech husband because a lot of, of the concerns in the community is about the uh, speech recognition. So, have you ever uh, think about how the loss functions are related to the uh, permanence of the loss, uh, of the ASR? Because most of them are only signal related, related to the signal uh, processing. And the other uh, question is that, uh, do you think that the processing the STFD domain is the best way of doing the ASR uh, for the experience en enhancement? Thank you. Yeah, um, so that's, that's an, an active uh, research problem. Um, so, of, of course, one way um, to, that, that, that you see in, uh, in attempts that people try to build, uh, for example, some features or some information from speech recognizers into the loss function to improve um, the, the uh, speech recognition performance after you enhance your signal. Um, what, what I generally observe is that uh, this is actually just related to the, the speech distortion you create. So you have to understand if you try to remove some background noise, so that's the positive effect, but you always create some uh, distortion to this speech signal itself. And we've seen a, a kind of direct uh, correlation between the speech distortion you create and the word error rate. Um, so if, if you simply manage to improve your audio quality by building uh, better, um, a better general loss function, which doesn't necessarily have to target uh, ASR, then you will also improve uh, the ASR performance. Uh, and so the second question is that, uh, do you think the SDFT domain processing the best way to do speed enhancement for the ASR purpose? Do you think that we can do it in the raw waveform domain or in the other FM domains or something like that? Um, so I, I think in, in practice, you, you will not gain much from um, and, uh, learning um, directly from, from audio because essentially what you, you impose an additional task on the network that it actually has to learn some kind of frequency transform. And um, that might be very specific to the data set you train on, but then you have an issue of generalization. Sebastian, uh, so, um, can I insert here? We have done that in the past. Noise suppression per frequency bin, and then converting to the future set, the MELS uh, filters for the speech recognizer, and noise suppressor using the same principles on male frequency band level. No difference. Yeah, I think so in, in practice, I expect a yeah. little to no difference. You, you might see differences on synthetic data sets, on small scale research data sets, but in practice, I think it's very questionable if it, this is worth the effort. Hello, uh, this is Yu Ching from Alexa AI, so I happen to be here. So uh, I was originally from Microsoft Research, actually working on CNTK, and then later on in Facebook AI. So uh, to follow up on these questions, so I was involved in the project of way to vec 2.0 and speech to text with, uh, the training. So they are actually we use raw audio signal and totally use unsupervised training. So get all the uh, raw audio we can have and then do a, a burst style of uh, pre-training and it works very well. And after doing the pre-training on unsupervised on the raw signal, and then we can do ASR, we can do uh, speech to text. Uh, translation. So we, we are able to do something like more than 26 languages in one model uh, for ASR and for speech to text with all raw signal. But the overhead is that we have a very big model. 
So mm-hmm. we have convolution learning the uh, on the signal side and then convert that into using uh, vector quantization and then do it uh, over a burst style per training and create the embedding of the signals, the raw signal, and then do translation over that. And so I'm wondering, what do you see in terms of uh, unsupervised per training? And although we are doing this so-called denoising autoencoder, but you never try on the task of spatial enhancement or, or, or real denoising task. So that's an interesting thing. And on the other hand, so uh, what do you see uh, in the future? Uh, the uh, acoustic uh, signal physics can uh, combine with the uh, pertraining. So now we are doing pertraining of deep models uh, disregarding any kind of uh, physics. And we just put everything into the time metric. And, but I believe that in the future, there should be something coming back. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so um, kind of uh, semi supervised or unsupervised training is, of course, very interesting and uh, will become more, more relevant in, in, in the future. Um, but I think it's, it's a very, still today, very difficult task. And uh, compared to the performance you achieve in practice, uh, comparing completely supervised training versus unsupervised training, it's, it's hard to achieve that same performance with unsupervised training. Um, so, and, and also your network needs, needs some prior information, what, what it actually should learn. So it, it cannot just learn without you giving it any information, right? Um, so at, at the current state, I think it's, it's uh, still a very extremely difficult problem for, for real applications. Uh, but of course, it, it might change in, in the near future uh, with advancements. But at, at the current state, I, I, for, for those problems, I see it uh, very difficult. So this, this might be different, different for speech recognition, um, because often you have um, an audio and, and some kind of transcription. But for speech enhancement, you basically never have any ground truth for unsupervised training. There, anything you have is just a recording of audio. And, and you don't have any information, okay, what is actually desired in here, what is undesired, what is the information in there. So that, that's kind of, I think, an extremely, extremely difficult problem for, for practice. But there, there might be solutions in, in the future. Any, any more questions? It's, uh, it's very late for Seattle and the, and the very early <laughs> for Spartan. And uh, yeah, any? Last minute question. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all of you for coming. So let's uh, thank the speakers and uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. yeah thank, thank you for inviting us. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you, bye. <clears throat>